Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Sherva. I'm the deputy sports editor here at the Los Angeles Times. And uh, if you are joining our Hangouts that started at 11.30, well, we had a big technical crash and we disappeared for a while, but now we are back. Uh, I don't know if it's related to the Wells Fargo hacking scandal or Chase or all the hacking that's going on. I kind of doubt it. I think it's just the, what happens with an emerging new technology that we're all just trying to figure out. So anyway, we're going we're gonna to do a restart, a reboot on this one. Uh, we've got our two columnists. Bill Dwyer, the former sports editor of the Los Angeles Times, and Bill Plaschke, one of the sports columnists of the Los Angeles Times. Bill Dwyer, also a sports columnist. Uh, they generally don't cross paths on uh, the things they cover, uh, which should make for an interesting discussion of uh, what we've got going on here. We talked a little bit before about the NFL official situation, and we're going to redo a little bit of that. Uh, it's uh, about a quarter of 12 here uh, live, and many of you may be watching this uh, on, a, uh, on a replay or uh, basically haven't gone to sports now and seen it there. And at this point, uh, a couple of the news organizations are reporting that they're very close between the NFL officials and the NFL. Uh, our reporter, Sam Farber, says that he's been told the exact opposite, that they are not very close but that th this is a negotiating ploy by the NFL that they are actually um, leaking the story so that they can bring the refs back to the table, and then when there's no agreement, they can blame it on the refs. Obviously, there's spinning going on on both sides, both on the NFL and the refs. Let's first turn to, uh, to uh, Bill Dwyer, who uh, was for a long time was a columnist for Referee Magazine, just sort of a labor of love for him. And uh, Bill, how do you see this situation and the latest developments on today? Well, John, I don't know any more about it than what you just said, but uh, these labor situations, we go through them in, in sports all the time. And, and I would think that uh, if Sam Farmer says it's a ploy, it's probably a ploy because there are a few better reporters than Sam Farmer. But I also think that, and I suspect Bill Plaschke would agree with me on this, that that it can't go on much longer and three or four weeks down the line at, at, at the outside that this will be settled and, and two weeks after that we'll forget about it. Mr. Plasky? Well, you know, I, you know, obviously I agree with Bill, it can't, it cannot go on like this. The game's an embarrassment, the games are a charade, the games are a joke, but you know what? The NFL owners have also proven to be an embarrassment, a charade, and a joke, and they don't care, you know, the integrity and, and I wrote this in today's paper, and I truly believe this, the integrity of their game can be compromised. They don't care as long as the integrity of their business is not compromised. And so far, business is booming. Their, the ratings have never been higher. The ratings for Sunday night's Ravens game, Ravens and Patriots game, the, the whole nation said what an outrage it was. It drew 10 million more viewers than the Emmys, okay? The, the Monday night after the Monday night debacle, which was, they say, the worst call in NFL history, Horrible, but the blackest mark in the league's history. Blah blah blah. Well, ESPN broadcast that game, and on a post-game sports center was the highest-rated sports center in ESPN history. So, um, sadly, sadly, we're hooked on football as a nation. And I think that while this is a black mark on the game, I think the games are compromised. The season's compromised. I see the owners. I totally agree with Sam Farmer. I can see the owners make it a ploy to try to act like the referees. It's their fault, and. They'll come back whenever they get it. It's all about power play, and the NFL owners always hold the gun to the heads of the fans and the players and, and now the officials of, of, well, we don't need you. Well, my experience, and I've uh, covered and been an editor on a lot of different labor negotiations, is this very simple rule. They don't get settled until they absolutely have to. I kind of think this is where they have to. Uh, Bill Dwyer, do, do you think that the referees and the officials – uh, when this is resolved will actually be appreciated when they're back out on the field or they'll become more invisible or they'll do the traditional thing where every no matter what sport it is they boo the officials when they're announced. I think there might be um, a small window of uh, appreciation John uh, but I think it pretty much uh, sports fans all of us are kind of fickle it's you know I don't remember what happened last week I don't care what happened last week uh, I think that if there is a little appreciation, it will go away quickly when that official calls pass interference against your team and costs you a game. And then the guys who are the veterans who have always been there, who know what they're doing, who have experienced the speed of this game, and that's why they're so much better than the, the current guys, will be just as big a bums as these poor guys are now. 
Uh, Bill Plasky. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, 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 not to interrupt you, John. I don't really agree with Bill on that. I think that, I think that this is has been so bad, and people have been so startled. I mean, frankly, I got to tell you, I didn't know there was this many rules in, in the NFL. I didn't know it was this hard to officiate an NFL game. I had no idea it was this difficult. And I think a lot of people may be thinking like me. I'm like an average fan when it comes to the NFL. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a hard job they have. I think this will stick with people. I think even in the other sports as well. I think. For the and, and, and Bill's probably right. Eventually, we're all going to forget about this and move on. But I think for a while, I think the referees have been empowered in all sports. In this, you'll see during the major league postseason, people screaming at umpires in the back of their minds. are like, wait a minute, now they can always bring in some replacements, and we see what that's like in football. You know, these guys have a harder job than you think, and they do a better job. So I think in all sports, I think officials all, everywhere should be applauding what's happened, although, of course, they're all going to be upset because their colleagues are being ripped so bad, the ones who are out there. But, but remember, these guys cross picket lines, so they're not, they're not going to get a lot, of, a lot of sympathy from a lot of people. But the bottom line is I think referees will be more empowered. I also think that um, Bill's right. There are a lot of rules, but I don't think that's the key issue. The key issue is these, these replacement guys are not familiar with the speed of the game, how fast it moves, and how much you have to do in a short amount of time. It takes a lot of time for the – Jerry Mark Bites and, and you know and, and latter day Jim Tunney to get their eyes connected and to get their rhythm themselves like an athlete. The speed of this game is so incredible. Um, I was just saying before that if you take a fan out of the stands, out of the 20th row, and you bring him down or her down for the last two minutes of the game, put him on, put him or her on the sidelines for the last two minutes of that game, they will be astounded at not only how hard the hitting is. But how fast everything moves, and that's oh yeah, Bill, I'm I'm scared. We go as reporters, we stay on the sidelines of these games the last five minutes, and I'm scared to death to even stand on the sidelines. I can't imagine actually being on the field. Yes, the speed and the hitting, it's so violent. It's and it's you know incredible. what the worst is, Bill. In my experience, I've covered a lot of pro games. You know, we've both been around a long time. The hardest hitting, most intense games I've ever seen, kind of as in a collective group, is the last two minutes of UCLA and USC. Oh, never seen anything like it. Mm-hmm. USC Notre Dame, not quite that way. Uh, some of the old Ram games we used to go down and see. UCLA and USC. Uh, I don't know how you officiate that. I don't know how you survive in those in that game, and especially the last two minutes of a close game. It's unbelievable. Before, now, John, John, but before we get off this topic, can I do one thing? So I gotta say it. It's nothing to do with the actual referee controversy, but something I really miss in officiating right now. I miss Red Cash and going. First down. <laughs> Can I do that again, John? Can I do that? Is that okay? One more time. First down. All right. Thank you. I just kind of missed that. I have no props, John. You can go on. Uh, okay. I just, I don't, that's not a prop. It's just me. <laughs> um, you know, the funny thing is we do remember the names of, of the referees. Don't the, we? It's so funny. And, right? and we should. Uh, but it's also true in the NBA. I mean, you know, uh, when you've got uh, Joey, Joey Crawford, Crawford at a Laker game, you just know he's going to be running that game, and it's not always best for the home team. Tim Donahue. I miss Earl Strom. You know, you're right. I, uh, I miss him. I miss, I miss those guys. What was it like, What was it like, Bill, like back, back, in, back when you had peach baskets? And, and how, was it, how were the games officiated then? You covered it then, right? Yeah, I covered it then. I was, I was there. Uh, when was George Mikan? Was George Mikan a good guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. George Mikan was a good interview, Plash. You would have liked <laughs> Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move off this topic on to another one. Um, the Dodgers are about ready to, uh, they are definitely circling the drain. The Angels are holding on just barely. Uh, two games back, they're really not out of it. Dodgers four and a half really are. Um, how disappointing a season is this in Los Angeles, especially especially down the road in, uh, in Anaheim? Whoever wants it first. I'll, let me say one thing before Bill gets at it because he's a much better baseball guy than I am. But I thought that, uh, and I'm not just saying this uh, because he's in front of me here, but the column that Bill wrote on the fact that the Dodgers, while being a disappointment this year, are going to be really good next year, I thought was was well put and, and well stated because that's exactly the case. It's for something, some reason, they, they have to be together for a while and, and, and they have to have some sort of chemistry, and those are all a bunch of cliches in the minds of a lot of us and a lot of the readers who are impatient and a lot of the fans, but there's a little bit of that with the Angels, too. I mean, there's, they're together, but it's taken Torrey Hunter the whole year to get them together, and the way Plaschke stated the, the Dodgers situation, I thought, was right on the money, and 
semi-brilliant. I won't give you brilliant. I'll just give you semi-brilliant. I've never even been close. To, I've never even had a South take that semi. I've never even been close to that. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, I th thanks, Bill. I think the Dod two different stories here. I think the Dodgers and their fans should be encouraged. I do not think of them as chokers. Uh, this is a team that, it, A, what did we learn from the Dodgers this year? We learned the owners will spend a lot of money. We learned they'll make the moves they have to make. They made the moves too late. This team needs spring training together. They, they, you know, you just don't throw these guys together in a batting order like this. They don't feed off each other right now. There's nobody protecting each other, taking a pitch for each other. They're all trying to hit three-run home runs. Matt Kemp's been hurt. That's a huge thing. I think Dodger fans should be encouraged because they have built a team, especially with Carl. Remember, Carl Crawford's coming back next year. Uh, they built a team that's going to be really, really good next year. Angel fans, they should be worried because this is a good team from the start. They were all together from the start, and the Oakland A's have pumped them. And, again, I think – the Angels are still in this race. The A's can still choke. But the Angels have to beat Felix Hernandez twice starting tonight. And he's the best, you know, arguably the best pitcher in, in baseball. And they got to beat him twice. So I don't know if that can happen. But I think Angel fans should worry because they've got – they have a lot of money they spent down there. They have great players. They didn't – I think the general manager didn't build the bullpen correctly. And I think that's a problem. And Bill sees, sees more Ranger games than I do. But the bullpen has been a mess down there. And I think where do you go from here? They're not going to fire Socia, and I'm glad they're not. Mike deserves at least another year of this team. Uh, I, you know, I think the guy's, guy's still one of the best managers in baseball. But what are they going to do as an Angels team? What do you do next year to get better, Bill? You should, Bill. You see a lot of their games. How, how would you address that? Yeah, I think there are um, a few things to be said about the Angels. Uh, we all use the word when we're writing about the Angels, underachievers, and I think that is correct. But I also think what we're missing is. Oakland and Baltimore are incredibly overachievers. Where did they come from? And you take them out of the mix, and it's a little bit different story. It's just a, a season that you can't figure. I agree with Bill that, that Socia certainly deserves another year, and probably more than that. I think he's under contract, contract Bill, was it through 2018? 2018, yeah. yeah. The other thing that's encouraging for Angels fans, even if they don't get in the playoffs, and, and you know, you got to grasp for straws then because it's, it's a really big downer if they don't get in the playoffs, which I think is a big long shot, is that Torrey Hunter is having such a great year, and he is the glue. And the fact that he's having a great year means that they will bring him back. They'll have to pay some money to bring him back. But if you're in that clubhouse enough, you realize who the leader is, who the mentor is, who the glue is. And, and without him next year doing all those little things that are important in the clubhouse, they'd really be in trouble, and, and I, I think that he will be there in a, an important role. I mean, he's batting above 300 for the first time in his career, so they got to bring him back. Yeah, but yeah, but Bill, don't you think they might also think eventually Mike Trout could be that guy? I mean, they think, you know, he's just a kid now, but Mike Trout could be a Darren Erstadt kind of leader. You know, remember, remember what Erstadt was like in there. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen enough of Mike Trout's personality to see. Yeah. If that's the case, yes, but I – uh, Torrey Hunter is an young incredible still. personality. You know it. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, he's dominant. Um, quick story, the night a couple of seasons ago that Howie Kendrick was sent down. It was a shocker because Howie Kendrick was the second baseman forever. And he was going to be, and everybody knew that, but he was sent down. So she wanted him to get some seasoning at AAA or whatever they do. And we hear about this uh, at the door of the locker room. We're going into for after the game quotes, and and, of course, once you hear that, the first person you go to is Howie Kendrick. You have to do that. That's what a newspaper guy does. And we're headed that way, and, and we're intercepted by Torrey Hunter, who says, guys, I know what you have to do, uh, but I know you're on deadline, but uh, give me about three minutes to talk to him. He just heard he's upset. I, I don't want you guys seeing a guy throwing stuff around the locker room. He did exactly that. We got to Kendrick. He was composed. These are the little things that uh, good story. It's not somehow. Oftentimes, what you do is how you do it, and that's just a prime example of what what uh, Tory Hunter does in that clubhouse. And he, boy, to replace him is going to be to replace that is going to be as tough as to replace a you know a three hundred hitter. And I don't know that Trout has that personality. He may develop it, but I think right now, uh, I was talking to another player the other day down there, and. They're they're amazed, all of them, even the other players, at how he lives in this bubble, and how he nothing phases him, and how he can just stay in that bubble. But staying in a bubble does not um, bring overall team leadership either. And I understand the kid's 22, 21 years old, and he's just trying to hit 320. Uh, but uh, the, to do that and to also do the leadership things that Tory Hunter does, that's a few years away. 
Okay, let's uh, move a little bit off of baseball. And uh, we had Mike DiGiovanna, our Angel beat writer, on last, uh, I think it was Thursday, and he was saying the most important uh, off-season acquisition or save that they have to do is for the Angels to keep Torrey Hunter. So I think uh, everyone's in agreement to that. Um, talk about leadership. Uh, we've got the Lakers. We've got the Clippers. We know who the Clipper leaders are. Who will be the Laker leaders? I mean, what will the addition of Steve Nash and Dwight Howard mean to this team from a chemistry standpoint? Uh, Bill Plasky? Well, I think, you know what, I think that part will be fine. I think Kobe, Kobe, it's still Kobe's team, and they all know it's Kobe's team, and he's not the same Kobe he used to be, and we saw last year Oklahoma City makes th three, two turnovers and two, four bad plays down the stretch. He's not the same clutch player he was, but he's still Kobe and he's still a great player, one of the NBA's greatest players ever. And I think these guys come in here knowing that now. So they know that. And I think Nash is the kind of guy that will accede to that easily. And I think Howard, Dwight Howard, while he's still coming back from his back injury, Howard knows it'll be his team eventually. And Kobe told me this. Kobe told me, they told Dwight, listen, it's going to be your team. I'm giving this team to you. You're going to have this team. I know it sounds crazy. Why should a player give a team to another player? How, how does that work? Who has the right to do that? In the NBA, that's how it is. Every team's got a guy. NBA is a star-driven league. So Kobe's told Dwight, this is going to be your team. I'm going to give this to you, young fella. Just not yet. Just not yet. Give me my last two years. Bring me a championship. Bring me number six so I can pass Magic and tie, tie Michael. Then I'm off into the sunset. And I, so I think the ground rules are pretty clear there. I don't see this being much of an issue. But I know a lot of people do. I, don't see, I think the, the issue is going to be health, is my opinion. But that, that, that's how I see it. Bill Dwyer, any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm right with him on it. I agree. I agree with all that. I think that uh, that Steve Nash is a is a huge uh, plus, and I think that if uh, he starts distributing the ball like he can, like few others in the game have ever been able to, and they all start to have fun with that as they will, including Kobe, that they'll be a team to be reckoned with, even though there's some age problems there. Um, I like the Clippers, uh, Chris Paul and Blake Griffin. If Blake Griffin has improved the outside shooting, that will be a uh, huge concern. Bill, you're right. That's a huge, huge concern. Yeah, he can't back down on guys, uh, you know, 40 minutes a game. He can't do that. And you got Grant Hill, of all people. What an interesting choice. Uh, here is, here's a guy in the, in the Torrey Hunter category. Uh, leadership, smart, has been around for a long time, has been injured a lot, so the legs may be fresher than we think they are at his age. And, and what between Chauncey Billups and uh, Grant Hill, you've got quite a team over there. Uh, uh, you've got a lot of intelligence. You've got a lot of people uh, who can play in spurts, you know, in five- and six-minute spans. So I think it's going to be a fun year uh, for the NBA in Los Angeles. I think there's no way around it. Yeah, I think it's really it's really interesting. The Clippers, though, it's all about. I talked to Chris Paul over in London at the Olympics, and it's all about Blake and DeAndre Jordan and what kind of summers they had. And I see Blake on these Subway commercials and all these other commercials. I'm hoping that he worked on his outside shot, and worked on his game, but I'm hoping he realizes, as the rest of us do, that these great dunks they're only two points. That dunk is only two points. It was great for a while, and all LA is amazed, and you know, Lob City and all that stuff. It's just two points. He needs to develop a more all-around game to be better. I, uh, right now, I would take Kevin Love over Blake Griffin as a power forward in a minute because he has more of an all-around game. DeAndre Not Jordan, only. the same way. You couldn't keep Jordan on the floor last year at the end of the games. So did these two guys have big summers? If they did, they'll have a big winner, this team. will. If they didn't, it'll, there'll be disappointment everywhere. And not only, Bill, is it only two points, but it's a dangerous two points. Every time he goes in there – Oh yeah, the guy is is making sure he's not embarrassed and he's banging around and the injury potential is is huge and and we're not going to want him to stop doing that, but if he could stop and pop from twenty feet consistently, it would help everybody. Oh my gosh, it would change everything. So that's just the question: is is he willing to do that? You know, has he put in the work and put in the time? We don't know. We're going to find out. Yep. And also, Grand Hill, by the way, great. That's a great thing you mentioned. Grand Hill's great leader, one of the game's best leaders. So he and Chauncey are going to keep that locker room settled and calm and quiet. He's the anti-Kenyon Martin. Kenyon Martin infected that last year. They got rid of Kenyon, and this is, he's like the anti-Kenyon Martin. Yeah, I'm not sure that team even needs a coach, but they have one. So Yeah, yeah. You know what? And I'm not so sure they only gave him a one-year contract. You know, he's a, he's a lame duck again. I'm not so sure, Bill, that he lasts through January if, if they get off to a bad start. I mean, I just think that they – 
they, they gave him a one-year contract for a reason. They didn't give him more than a one-year, and I was really surprised at that. So we'll see. Well, I asked this question yesterday of our basketball guys, and so I'll ask it of you. Um, who gets fired first, whether it be this season or next season, uh, Vinny or Mike Brown? That's a great question. I think, I think um, because Jimmy Buss, you saw how long it took Jimmy Buss to get rid of Andrew Bynum, even though I told him two years ago he should have got rid of Andrew Bynum. I've been on him for two years to do it. He finally did it. It takes him a long time to get rid of somebody he, he likes. He hired Mike Brown. He hired him ahead of Mitch Kupchak. I think if you had put a lot of, a lot of detector tests, I bet Mitch would say he would, he would rather have had Rick, Ad, Rick Adelman and I think a lot of people on the team, and I don't know, I should not, I'm not speaking for Mitch, I'm just saying in general, let's just say in general, people thought Rick Adelman might have been a better choice at the time. Uh, so, but Jimmy loved Mike Brown, loved, every, loved the interview, blew him away the interview, blew him away with everything. That's his guy. So he's not going to give up on him too, too easily. And Kobe, he's working with him. And again, Mike Brown's the nicest guy in the world. He's the nicest man ever. And I really love him. I love dealing with the guy. He's tremendous. You know, he's got a great family. He's a great guy. Can he survive if they don't win? I still think he lasts longer than Vinny because Jimmy's so tied to him. I agree. I think that uh, not not necessarily for anything positive about Mike Brown. I just think that uh, Vinny is kind of in a situation where the Clippers and Donald Sterling and the front office has done all the things that they should have been doing for years, and it's like, okay, now come on, we have to. You know, last year didn't quite get there getting better but we have to show great improvement and and uh, and if the improvement if you get you know one god forbid one injury of Chris Paul or Blake Griffin or even you know out two weeks it can affect the team a lot and and uh, the expectations in Clipper camp are very high and I would think that the patience level is pretty low and uh, if all doesn't go well quickly I, as I said earlier I'm not so sure that they they feel like the coaches is crucial on on that team as as a lot of the players in the Chauncey. A lot of people thought Chauncey coached at the end of last year. You're right, Bill. So yep. so I I I, th I agree that Vinny's a little bit on a uh, a shorter ledge than than Mike Brown, but uh, we could have them both do great, and and uh, that would be wonderful for the city and the sports fans. What did the What did the NBA guys say yesterday, John? Uh, well, not surprisingly, Brez said that. Uh, that he thought that uh, Mike Brown would be first gone, and uh, Brad thought that uh, Vinny would be the first one gone. So, okay. it's, <laughs> so you know. Um, and I, I've got to say though, if you talk about coaching, I don't thought, think I saw a better coaching job than Vinny did in Game Seven against Memphis. Um, that was definitely as high. And and if he coached every game that way, he wouldn't be with the Clippers. Oh, well, absolutely. He's no he's no dummy. Vinny knows how to coach. It's just. Uh, it's more circumstance than his ability, I think, that puts him uh, kind of behind the eight ball. Yeah, it does. He does. He wasn't hired. This is not a team he was hired to coach. He was hired to coach a rebuilding team, not a star team. Exactly. Okay, uh, we've got a question from our readers, and then we'll uh, wrap it up shortly after that. Uh, and I, I'll throw this first out to Bill Plaschke because I think he's covered three more hockey games the last ten years than Bill Dwyer has. So uh, we'll six. ask. They, they, they won in six games. I've covered six times. That's, six. Oh, that's right. You did all six. That's right. You just didn't do the home games. Okay. Um, I did it in 1998, John. John, yes. I, I went to New Jersey, John. Yes, believe me. I know that. <laughs> okay. What, will, uh, what effect will AEG's impending sale have on the Stanley Cup champion Kings going forward? Now, first off, you said reader. Did they send in this question having watched this? Uh, it was actually sent in advance because oh, so they're a viewer. So they're a viewer, John, not a reader. They'd be a viewer. A viewer. Uh, I think it'll be good. You know what? People, the Kings won last year in spite of their owner. I'm sorry, Phil Anschutz has never really paid to pay attention to that franchise. Tim Lawicki loves it and has done his best, but Anschutz has never really spent the money. And re only last year he started to do that. I think you get a hockey owner in this town like the Guggenheims own baseball. Who know they got to have to have stars in this town and spend money. I think it's it'll be great for the Kings because last year they won in spite of their owner. That is my opinion. Bill Dwyer. <laughs> all right, that's that, that. That's all he's got to say. Okay, next. <laughs> I have no idea, John, what what ownership difference means for hockey. I, uh, uh, I better I, dental plan. I with Bill in that Anschutz uh, should have been out there in front and and. Being interviewed by us and things like that. That's just he's a he's a real estate guy. He's not a hockey guy. He yeah. didn't care. 
Okay, well, let's wrap up this broadcast with uh, one question. It's been a as they often are, an incredible year in sports, and uh, both Bills were, uh, were with me in London for a phenomenal games, but not just London throughout the, the whole year. Uh, Bill Dwyer, what's been your favorite moment that you have covered in sports this year? Wow. I wish you would give me a little... Uh, I, guess I, I guess it'll <laughs> oh, have to be an Olympic thing. It, uh, my favorite moment had to do with not a U.S. athlete, but the, the Irish boxer... Katie Taylor, uh, and how she captivated an audience uh, and a sport that, uh, you know, women's boxing, the first time in the Olympics, and, and I didn't have any expectation for any sort of um, anything going on, and, and the place went crazy, and, and the Irish took over, and uh, it was memorable just to see how she kind of saved the sport. I thought they would probably throw boxing, women's boxing, out after this Olympiad because they simply – put it in there for numbers equalizing the females and the males, but um, I think she herself with with her charisma and what she did and how she won and what kind of crowd she attracted and what kind of frenzy that crowd had uh, saved women's boxing. And I, I'm i sure there were other great moments that I saw that I'm not remembering, but that one popped to mind right away. It was, it was, it was special uh, those couple of days when she was winning boxing in London. I think, I think my favorite one was the, just the general, I think the most, in fact, I think it's a, the, my favorite development in L LA sports this calendar year has been the, the Clippers going to Clipper games in March and April and seeing how completely changed it is over there. It's the greatest. A Clipper game now is arguably the greatest atmosphere in LA sports at this point. USC fans, football fans are down on the team. The Coliseum's gone quiet. Dodger fans haven't come back yet. You know, I, th I think the Cl I think the, the the Clippers. You know what? I'm I'm saying this as I'm saying this. I'm realizing. The Kings won the Stanley Cup. Okay, that was it. Forget that. Cross that off. It was that Kings, it was watching the Kings win the Cup in the Staples Center. And I've never seen the Cup ceremony before. It was. It gave me absolute chills to see the fact that it's such a big deal to bring the Cup out. And each player took it and kissed it and skated around the ice. And people in the stands are crying. People on the ice are crying. Their families are all there. That was, yes, the Kings that night when they beat the Devils. And they won the Stanley Cup, and they all celebrate. That that was the most memorable uh, moment in LA sports this year. I, I will say that uh, I didn't know it was on my bucket list of things that I wanted to do until I actually did it, and that was to go down onto the ice after Game Six of oh. the Kings. Uh, I didn't know that experience existed. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm so glad that I did. Anyway, that's it for today. Uh, you guys were absolutely great. Uh, uh, we'll do it again in the future, not too distant future. I uh, tell a lot of these people we do these daily and probably more frequently Bill, than you Bill, guys. How, can I ask Bill, what's that, what's that torch? Is that like an Olympic torch behind you there? That's pretty cool. What is that? Yes, I have. Um, there's a story behind it, and we probably don't have time, but I, uh, I ran with uh, the torch in, in Seoul. They, the Koreans asked me to run with the torch. So I ran a kilometer with the torch. Um, then they gave me the torch afterwards, and I wrote a column about it. And um, Peter Uberoth was kind of pissed off because I wrote a column about that. This is four years after the uh, 88 Olympics. He said, well, I could have given you a torch, too. So he gave me a torch. So I, you can see one behind me, but I have one on each wall, one from 84 and one from 88, and they're among my prized possessions. Do you have one from the first Athens Games? Yeah, what no, was that I like? Uh, yeah, I think it was Paris in 1924. Was Jesse, well, Bill, Bill, before, before, before we go seriously, what kind of interview was Jesse Owens? What kind, how was he with uh, with Hitler? In fact, were you able to get time with him or Hitler uh, during that during that? I had uh, lunch with him one day, Bill. And, both and, of them? Okay, good. Yeah, Hit, Hitler was very outgoing, but Jesse was kind of shy. Yeah, okay, okay, that's good. That's all. <laughs> okay, well, that's it for today. Tomorrow, 1130, we've got Chris Dufresne, Chris Foster, Gary Klein to, to talk college football, even though USC is off for the week. And by the way, in case you missed it, those wonderful people at UCLA kicked all the media out of practice today because a camera showed up. We'll maybe talk about that. And then on Friday, Mark Thompson, Sam Farmer with their NFL Slam. Uh, that's a can't miss. So that's it for today. If you've missed any part of this broadcast, just go to sports now on latimes.com and uh, read about, or not read, but uh, see a rebroadcast of this. Uh, those of you who uh, are addicted to your print product, as I think we all are, uh, Bill Dwyer will have a column uh, tomorrow on the Ryder Cup, we believe. And we're unsure if Bill Plashy is going to write because we don't know what's going on with the uh, NFL officials. We have to wait on that. Yeah. So come back for that. So that's it for today, and we'll see you later.